Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Pete Evanson is the COO and co-founder of Swoop. Swoop is a VC-backed transportation tech company headquartered in Los Angeles, California, my hometown, with inventors like Signia Venture Partners, South Park Commons, and the former chief product officer of Uber, Manik Gupta. Swoop is disrupting the $74 billion fragmented private transportation economy, which still runs on pen and paper and legacy tech from the 1990s. Prior to starting Swoop, Pete was at Microsoft for five years, where he helped their online stores expand internationally and led multiple sales teams for their cloud divisions. Both of his parents are entrepreneurs running small businesses in Los Angeles, and that sparked him to start his own and follow in the family's footsteps. So Swoop was born. So Pete, how are you doing today? Good to see you. Good to chat with you. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Likewise. Excited to be here. Thanks, Harry. Definitely. So, you know, I would love, well, there, there's a lot of actually uh, areas I want to start. I guess if I have to pick one, I'm going to, can you give us a quick uh, sort of overview and recap of Swoop? You know, we actually have had uh, Ruben from Swoop on and that was pre, it was actually right at the start of the pandemic. We literally recorded the episode and I think COVID dropped <laughs> the following week. And I think we had to put a little disclaimer in the episode that it was like, hey guys, just FYI, COVID dropped. But um, uh, can you can you give us a quick uh, background? Yeah, I like, I like the way you put that, COVID, COVID <laughs> dropped. I mean, that... That's one way to put it for sure. Yeah. But um, uh, no, it's it's been a, a really exciting, obviously there's been uh, quite a bit going on uh, within just ground transportation and, and your own experience. Obviously you can attest to that, but um, a little bit of, about Swoop. So we build software for the private transportation industry. So uh, the way you can think about private transportation, it's you know, made up of small businesses, whether those are owner operators or uh, multiple vehicle owners. And they essentially uh, employ drivers, own their vehicles from sedans and SUVs to mm -hmm. shuttles and charter buses. And it's a $74 billion industry. So mm. um, it is much larger than one may anticipate. And that $74 billion does not yeah. include, you know, Uber, Lyft, Rideshare, et cetera. Mm. Um, and what we do is, so we have two products. One of those products is the Swoop Marketplace. And that is uh, where people looking for ground transportation can book from these operators directly. And we have another software called Moves, which we're very excited about. And this is a business in a box, all in one software for transportation companies to manage mm -hmm. their own business. So their rides, reservations, dispatch, etc. So uh, that's a little bit of a rundown on Swoop. We've been around for about four years now. Yeah, nice. No, that's super helpful. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it was actually all the way back in uh, episode 124, it looks like. So I think this is going to be close to 200. So it's been a, quite a few episodes since uh, you guys were last on. It sounds yeah. like a lot has changed in a positive way. And I kind of wanted to start with that term, private transportation industry, right? Because I mean, I think everyone knows Uber and Lyft, everyone knows taxis, but you guys are kind of in a category of your own. So can you drill down, like, what is your definition of private transportation industry? Because $74 billion, that sounds like a lot. That sounds very impressive. So who's in, who's out of the private transportation industry? Yeah. So who we can remove just right out of the gate would be, um, you know, Uber, Lyft, taxi right so okay. we can we can pull those out um these the, the private transportation industry it's it's typically these small businesses who uh they're made up of mom and pop shops mm -hmm. and 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 it's super fragmented so i'll just kind of uh, yeah. mention that at the at the beginning right there's only uh, I think that the largest company owns 1% market share or less than 1%. So it's extremely fragmented. And, hmm. you know, what it, what these operators do is they typically have rides like private transportation to the airport, mm -hmm. uh, corporate uh, events, corporate offsites, uh, weddings, uh, hmm. wineries, right? And this can be anything from a black car sedan, a black car SUV, all the way up to a charter bus and everything in between. So limousines, shuttles, 
anything along those lines. Yeah. So I think I, I love the real life examples because it sort of helps me picture it in my head, right? Like if I want to go to the airport, you know, I've got Uber and Lyft, I've got a taxi, I can call my mom, call my friend, <laughs> make my wife take me. But, um, you know, some people call for a private car to take them. And I mean, I guess that's, you know, to me that I think of that as more of a luxury segment, but this private transportation industry isn't all luxury, right? Because there's also sort of like the group transportation side of things where I guess you could have, you know, Mercedes Sprinter vans and, you know, really nice party buses and limos, but there's also sort of just like, I guess on the group transportation side, there's everything from, you know, more practical and economical all the way up to luxury, but on the private ride side, I mean, you know, if you're calling someone, you know, for a private ride to take you to the airport, that's typically more than an Uber and Lyft, right? Is that sort of how you think about the two? I think about it a couple different ways. So when I compare UberX or some of the, let's say more budgeted items, yeah. um, when you compare apples to apples with private transportation, private transportation is going to be a high, higher price point mm -hmm. because you get, let's say a chauffeur that comes with it. A chauffeur can be a little bit more than a driver, right? I think a driver will get you point A to point B. I think a chauffeur will get, care more about the experience yeah. and, and the experience of, let's say, opening the door or their attire mm -hmm. or um, the ability to control how the vehicle is and the cleanliness and all of those things, right? Um, so there is a little bit more of a premium that you're going to pay. I yeah. would compare it more to, let's say, an, an Uber Black, right? Mm -hmm. um, or an Uber Lux, where nowadays the price point of those yeah. versus, let's say, <laughs> just booking a, uh, a, a, a private transportation vehicle, they're actually quite similar. So if I were yeah. to go to the airport and I were to book, let's say, an Escalade from a small business operator, it would probably be quite similar to what I would pay on Uber or Lyft. Now, to your other point where you talk about budgeted, uh, items within this space. Now, um, private transportation, it's, it's all over and mm -hmm. it's difficult for one to really know how prevalent it really is. So uh, a couple of our operators will shuttle nurses to and from hospitals mm -hmm. that need to kind of distribute vaccines, for example. Yeah. Um, there's private transportation with airlines where they need to move pilots from the hotel mm -hmm. to the airport and back. Right. Um, we have relationships with corporate companies who need to shuttle their employees going back to work and doing so safely. Um, so there's all of these elements of private transportation, both on a premium side and let's say non premium side. So the opportunity is endless. I think when you when you uh, drill down more into what is it. There are multiple opportunities in where private transportation actually lies today. Yeah. And I guess it's interesting too, because there's sort of consumer opportunities and there's business to business opportunities and there's sort of, you know, more fun events like weddings and there's more, you know, corporate mm -hmm. events like corporate retreats, right? Both I think would kind of qualify as a B2B option. So I think it's, you know, I, I, as you know, like I think this space is just really interesting because it's so large, because there's so many opportunities, but also because it's so fragmented, you know, I think you had a nice line in your intro about how a lot of this industry is done on pen and paper. And I'm thinking from the consumer side, right? If I need a ride like this, I might go to Yelp. I might go to Google, you know, like sort of, you know, maybe I go to Craigslist, right? Like not great options, you know, not a marketplace like Swoop, which I imagine, you know, which you guys have found a nice niche there. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the market. And I guess also like, what are you guys doing that sort of improves, right? I mean, I guess the pen and paper, you know, we can kind of imagine how a lot of these businesses are operating. So let's talk a little bit about how you guys are improving that experience, you know, either for customers or fleet owners or drivers, mm -hmm. or where do you want to start? Yeah, let's start with the customer first, because that's really how we got started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I bit my business partner, uh, co-founder and CEO of, of Swoop, he comes from a transportation background. So his yeah. parents had owned and uh, operated transportation companies, essentially, but since the time he was born, right? So he kind of grew up in this. He's, he's seen it evolve or, or uh, lack thereof with the improvements in technology and, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, when we created Swoop, we really focused on the customer first. And um, the way that customers book historically has been through a lot of phone calls, right? Mm -hmm. I think 93% at the time when we first started, uh, rides were happening through or bookings were happening through just a phone call, right? Yeah. Um, operators were writing down the trip and, and passing that piece of paper essentially yeah. to the driver, right? Um, and so what we set out to create was one, let's make it so it's a better booking experience for mm -hmm. the person that's actually booking the ride. 
Um, let's have it be digital. Let's give them an experience that would be similar to, let's say, an Airbnb or booking on kayak or the improvements that you see in the airline industry that you, for a while there, you just didn't see within the private mm -hmm. transportation industry. So we started really with the booking experience. And two, because it's so fragmented, you get a lot of these corporate companies who want to book and have one consistent billing experience, but yet there's so many other operators mm -hmm. and the way that they do things is so different. So we try to make some, uh, I, I'd call it cohesiveness within the industry where yeah. we can drive scale by working with all of these small business operators, but give the end customer one consistent experience, right? Just like a true marketplace. And so we set out to let's, hey, let's work on creating one cohesive experience for the end customer. And I think the last one would just be pricing. Mm -hmm. Pricing fluctuates, yeah. whether it's by market, whether it's by SNB. Um, so we tried to, let's say, aggregate pricing, um, create you know formulaic ways to make it easier for somebody to book with transparent pricing the same way that a marketplace would. So we tackled those things head on and that really led to the success of the marketplace which then we raised a couple rounds on the marketplace. But then from there, we really started to work on this other software, which is Moves, because we noticed that all of these operators were still on pen and paper and they yeah. needed the tools to be able to run a successful business, you know, in 2022, for example. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think uh, the Move software that you guys have built has been some, it's been really interesting to sort of follow along. And obviously, you know, coming from my end, you know, I'm sort of coming at it from the other end of the spectrum. And you've got a lot of obviously Uber and Lyft drivers and gig workers out there. And, you know, what I think is always so interesting is whether they realize it or not, they're running a business, yet uh, they sort of have built in lead gen, right? They've got a lot of, not a lot, but they've got some to a lot of built in aspects of running a business, right? Like Uber. Uber and Lyft will send them rides, right? And they don't have to worry about that piece, for example. But um, you still you need to think about like diversifying your income. You don't want just Uber. You might want Lyft too, right? You got to think about your expenses. And so it's sort of this weird gray area. And that's what I kind of like about Moves is that it seems like it allows folks, you know, either on the you know platform side right now to kind of graduate and become an actual driver. Or if you're already running one of your businesses, you know, kind of in the group transportation space and you don't have... A lot of the tech, you know, you can kind of attack it from that side of things. Like I'm already doing an actual business, but I'm not using the right tools. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that and how you guys are approaching it. Obviously, I'm sure you have a lot of ins with sort of that latter group. Um, but yeah, totally. what do you think? Well, the gig economy, when it really took off, it gave this opportunity to people to say, hey, be your own boss, yeah. right? And, uh, and work with, uh, we'll give you customers essentially, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and we'll take a piece of that. And obviously that, that came from Uber and Lyft and you started to see that really trickle down, whether it be, you know, the door dashes of the world um, and gig economy really took off. And uh, now you're seeing uh, people and they're saying, hey, you know, I wanna have my own business. I yeah. wanna have my own customers because we all know that Uber and Lyft at the end of the day, they're the ones that truly own those customers that they're sending to you. Um, and so what we've seen is that the creator economy, which you see with, let's say, YouTube creators, for example, mm -hmm. is now um, being compared to, let's say, mobility, where you have these operators who can be their own creators, who actually can be their own boss and be less reliant on some of these platforms like Uber and Lyft. Uh, and that's really what we did when we set out to create moves is that we wanted to give these operators the same tools to mm -hmm. compete at scale where they could manage their own customers. Yeah. They could get customers to come and purchase from them. They could get online awareness. They could build a website. They could manage their payments. They could do all of those things, but wouldn't be as reliant on, let's say, an Uber or Lyft to be able to get there. And that's really what we've seen over the last year when we started to create moves is, hey, let's give you these same tools so you can compete at scale. And so far, it seems like that trajectory is really taken off because you have this creator economy within the mobility space. Yeah. Well, let's stick on this high level theme and then we'll drill down to uh, sort of specifically, you know, kind of getting onboarded with moves and how it might help someone like yeah. me if I'm a gig worker and, you know, want to start my own transportation business. But, you know, I think you mentioned something really interesting. You said that there, these apps are really good at giving you customers and that kind of a light bulb went off in my head. Like that is really what they're good at, right? Like they're not good at a lot of other stuff to be honest, but yeah. what they're really good at is aggregating demand 
and, you know, opening the fire hose and sending that to you. And I think we actually see that across the industry, right? Whether it's rides or whether it's food delivery, I mean, it's a big problem in food delivery, mm -hmm. right? All the restaurants complain that the fees are too high that these companies take, yet they're all on them because when they put their restaurant on DoorDash, it's like, boom, orders. You know, I saw someone tweet out the other day. It's like, well, we had 12 orders sitting there when we opened, you know, like people have been queuing up and scheduling their orders and it was almost like too many, right? So I think that aspect is interesting uh, that these platforms are really good at giving you customers, but it seems like there is this sort of wave, you know, like you said, this creator economy and, you know, just like in general people, you know, like getting customers is nice, but really if you're trying to build an actual business long-term sustainable, you kind of almost have to go this route of building your own business, right? Whether you're in transportation or whether you're in the restaurant industry, right? You can't rely on these platforms. And I just feel like that's like one thing that's so important about this creator economy that a lot of people are realizing that you, you know, it's great, you know, to make money from one source, but you got to have mm -hmm. multiple, right? So I'm just curious if you have any high level thoughts on that. It's, it's interesting because who wins at the end of the day, because like you said, these aggregators are really good at generating demand, mm -hmm. right? And where these, let's say, operators have struggled is they really want to have customers themselves, but how do they get their own customers? Yeah, And that creates a reliance on these platforms. So we started with that piece first, right? Okay. And we said, hey, these operators really need to generate their own customers because, hey, they can, they can manage customers, right? They can handle payments. They can provide a great transportation experience or in yeah. food delivery, they can provide a great experience in delivering food, but how do they get customers? And I think that, that that's something where one, restaurants are going to start to say, hey, how can I work directly with operators to say, hey, ABC transportation or hey, uh, Harry's limo rides, why don't you come and work directly with me and yeah. I'll pay you, you know, 5% extra for everything that you do. And so I don't have to pay 35% to, to Uber or DoorDash or of the equivalent. Um, we're also giving them marketing tools, right? So when you mm -hmm. think about online awareness, most of the rides that happen today are happening through online searches. So giving them the proper tools to run Google Analytics campaigns and Facebook campaigns so they can be uh, uh, you know, prevalent and they can drive awareness. So from a high level, it will be interesting because I think the issue stems from who can generate demand. Mm -hmm. But once these operators actually start to get in that motion where they feel comfortable to drive that demand, I think the sky's the limit. And you're going to yeah. start to see some of the market share being taken, you know, from some of these larger uh, platform companies like yeah. Uber and Lyft. So let's say I'm someone, I want to sign up with the Moves platform and really start my own transportation business. Um, what, what, what's, it, what's it take and what are kind of the first steps? Yeah. So when you're signing up for Moves, we generally look at the type of customer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, because private transportation focuses on the premium side, uh, Uber and Lyft drivers, if you are doing Uber Lux, or if you were doing, you know, Lyft, uh, black car, for example, you would probably be an ideal customer, right? Yeah. Um, we do have some customers who, um, you know, are, are doing Uber X who want to get into to starting, you know, their own business. But, um, uh, generally what we've seen in terms of success is that if you have, you know, a black car SUV, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of the, the perfect person to get started. Um, so yeah. I mean, I experience. guess because those folks yeah. also already have, you know, in California, they would already have a TCP license, which, exactly. which is like a license for hire. And then they also have commercial insurance. And so I think that makes sense that those are sort of your ideal customers. But I will say that, you know, we know a lot of Uber X drivers who are kind of like, this is on their radar or they've looked into it and it might be a bigger commitment, I guess mm -hmm. you would say, but I feel like there are, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because I think there are a lot of Uber X and just regular Lyft drivers out there who, you know, don't even know that this option exists. And I sort of want to just put it on their radar because I feel totally. like a lot of them could have a lot of success. So I appreciate that, you know, that that's the background of kind of like your ideal customer. But, um, you know, also I think on the Uber X side, like, I think this is like an interesting consideration. All right, back to you. Well, yeah, no. So, so it's interesting because we've actually had a lot of interest coming from Uber X, uh, yeah. Uber XL, um, uh, you know, Lyft drivers who they're kind of fed up with just the reliance on Uber yeah. and, and Lyft and they want to start 
their own business. And so um, anybody that is looking to start their own business, they can go and, and do this with moves, right? And so what does that generally look like? One, when you sign up, we're going to give you tools to create a website, mm -hmm. create your branding, right? Um, we want to verify that you have insurance, right? So pretty basic stuff. And whether you're, a, a, you're doing commercial, right? We're going to verify that. If you want to just stay and doing more of the consumer rides, right? We'll verify that insurance. You upload your vehicle and now you have the tools, one, so people can go and book directly from you through your website and through this booking yeah. tool, right? Um, you could generate awareness through our marketing programs that we have already set up. Um, you can manage payments so customers can pay by credit card directly from you and that money comes funnels into your account, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we don't take, you know, a percentage of that. Um, so there's all of these different elements that somebody can just want sign up and get going. Now, how do you generate demand? One, if they do, you guys charge have, a monthly fee, or how does that part? We work? do. Yeah. Okay. So the so the starting monthly fee is ninety nine dollars a month, okay. and uh, and then that ranges up to two ninety nine. Two ninety nine being some of the more marketing driven programs that we do. So Got we it. spend a lot of time just getting their Google Ads set up and making sure that they're going to get traffic to their website. And I think that's the number one key is how do we generate awareness for these operators, whether it's an Uber X driver who's graduating to now yeah. becoming their own boss and managing everything through moves, or it's a one that maybe has their existing book of business through pen and paper, but they want to solidify that in one consistent place and digitize their business. They can also do that through moves. Yeah. Well, I've got some ideas to generate demand. So I'm curious to get your feedback, but let's start. So I'm okay. I'm someone, you know, let's, let's go with this example of I'm uh, looking to graduate from Uber X or I'm an Uber black driver and I come on, I sign up with moves I'm paying the monthly fee. And then what are sort of, you know, once I've got my website and everything set up, it sounds like kind of the most important next step is like, where do I get my rides from? Right. Where does that totally. demand come from? How do you guys exactly. help? And sort of what's uh, how do the responsibilities uh, shake out between you and myself? Yeah. So where we can help and where we can step in is um, we'll help set up your Google ads for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So anytime somebody searches, get a ride to LAX airport, yeah. your business is going to pop up. Right. The websites that we create for you are fully SEO optimized. That way, you know, Google crawling can basically legitimize your website or, or ensure it's legitimized and then people can find you. Help set up your Facebook ads so people can search through Facebook and Instagram and find you. So those are two elements where we help. I think where we need the operator to step in, there's an element of hustle yeah. that actually needs to take place here, right? So they need to have business cards. They need to have pamphlets that they can basically print out and hand to customers that ride with them, people that maybe they could pick up or neighbors that they can hand these business cards to and get those people to leave them reviews on Yelp. Google business, mm. et cetera. So there is an element of hustle that needs to take place. And if they basically do that for one or two months, right? Get all your friends and family to leave reviews on your Yelp page, do yeah. it on Google, do it on Facebook, right? Let's make sure your social pages are all set up. Anytime somebody rides in your car, hand them a business card to say, hey, next time you book with me, get 15 bucks off your next ride, right? Now, anytime that a customer comes back, that's a repeat customer, that's your customer at the end of the day, yeah. right? So we can help out to a certain extent through Google and Facebook and lead gen, but there is an element of things that they need to do to ensure that they're driving their own demand. Yeah. As well. I, I really like that you brought up that there's an element of hustle needed, right? Because I, I think what we see on the gig platforms is that, you know, I mean, probably folks following our stuff are probably tend to be more in that hustle category. Cause really my whole business is predicated on the fact that, you know, if you know what you're doing and you hustle, you can make more than the average driver. But, you know, I'd say maybe half of drivers, you know, especially in the gig economy, just are kind of doing it right. They take whatever rides come, they do them. They're not really thinking, you know, they enjoy it and they're having fun and they like the flexibility, but they're not putting a ton of thought and definitely not a ton, you know, they might be good drivers and might be providing good experience, but I like that term hustle, right? Because I think mm -hmm. that's really, I mean, running a business is tough. Like, let's be honest, right? <laughs> you're a business owner. I'm right. a business owner. You're working with a lot of business owners. So that is an important quality and trait. So I think it's important to kind of set the right expectations, like who can be, you know, like, okay, you can make a lot of money and, you know, do this and do that. But like, who's the right person for this? Do you have this personality? And if you don't, that's okay, but be ready to flex those muscles, be ready to work it. Right. So I like this, you know, I want to 
drill down on this marketing and sort of demand side. Cause you know, so to me, it seems like that first level is kind of like the friends and family level, right? So it's like mm -hmm. email your friends, let your family know, post on your Facebook page, you know, post on your LinkedIn. Yep. Like I'm starting to do some rides. Here's my service. Here's what I offer. Right. And kind of just, you know, spreading awareness, right? Like you would tell your parents first, right. About your, the new business that you're doing. And then, uh, you know, maybe your neighbors too, right? I also like that option, right? Because especially if you're giving rides and people live near you, that's, mm -hmm. you know, a natural opportunity of a 30 second pickup time. <laughs> that's very convenient. Yeah. And then start going into your extended circle. And I think this is where it starts to get a little challenging and where I like helping out a lot of drivers because, you know, you've got the business cards, you've got the pamphlets. I mean, again, right, you can go to your direct neighbors, but why not go to your entire neighborhood and pass out mm -hmm. business cards and pamphlets? And, you know, that may be a very low ROI, right? Because like who actually those, but if you get one or two customers, they live right next to you and maybe they want to go to the airport, you know, and now it's like that ride is going to be very valuable to you. Um, and so I think beyond that too, uh, you know, actually one thing that I've always been surprised by, and I see this a lot in the restaurant space. I'm going to keep using this example because that's where, you know, we see a lot of uh, opportunities. Like, you know, there's all these restaurants using these third-party delivery platforms and they never put their business card in the order bag mm -hmm. to go. Totally. I've, seen it, I've seen it once or twice out of, you know, like maybe 1% of orders. So I think it's that same concept is leveraging, hey, Uber and Lyft are great platforms for demand. There's nothing, you know, you're an independent contractor. There's nothing that says you can't go on there and, you know, you wouldn't, don't not need to be pushy about it. But, you know, if the passenger loves you and they're like, oh man, you are the best driver I ever had. It's like, yeah, take my business card, book with me directly next time. Yeah. Right? Like there's nothing wrong with that. And I feel like even that, like to me, that seems very simple, but I feel like for a lot of people, like that concept, I don't know, maybe they feel that it's not kosher or maybe they feel that, you know, I don't know, maybe they never thought of it, but I, I think it kind of just hits on that element of hustle. Where we've seen a lot of success with the, the operators that come on, they do exactly that. They have the element mm -hmm. of hustle. Maybe they do Uber, Lyft, and uh, they also manage their own book of rides. Yeah. And anytime that they get a customer that comes through Uber and Lyft, they'll hand them a business card and say, hey, you know, thanks so much for, for riding with me today. If you don't mind, could you also leave me a review on my Google business page, for mm -hmm. example, right? Um, or if you're ever looking to purchase, you know, directly, right, you can get 15 bucks off your next ride. And you're starting to see that come into motion, uh, but it is an element of hustle. You have to yeah. be able to do those things. You have to feel comfortable and sometimes you'll get rejected. That happens, right? Yeah. As a business owner, we know that <laughs> yeah. rejection comes 90% of the time, but those 10% that come through are really going to push the needle for you to say, hey, I'm actually driving success in my business. Yeah. There's other third-party aggregators outside of Uber and Lyft that you can leverage as well, whether you're a black car owner and you want to use Blacklane or gettransfer.com. Mm -hmm. I have a list of them that I can share with you, Harry, that you can cool. send to the rest of uh, you know, the listeners. But you should be doing as an operator, you should be doing those same things with those, uh, you can go on Thumbtack, right? Yeah. You can go and get these rights booked and start to build your own book of business. But it's, it's clear that you need some sort of online awareness and you need some reviews online to build that trust. Yeah. I think that's really, really key. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I'm sure there's some other parts uh, of running the business. So I don't want to spend all the time on demand, although it is, you know, the most important. So we spent a lot of time on that, but I think it is important. So let's hit on, you know, maybe one or two other items that uh, you think are really important to running your own transportation business and sort of how moves, uh, you know, plays a part in that. Yeah. So I think a couple other elements in terms of running a business, um, I think one is payments. I mm. think you're starting to see an evolution of payments really start to, to unfold where uh, we started to see over time, especially with taxis, where they were more reliant on, on cash. I remember the days of like a taxi yeah. driver wouldn't even take you from point A to point B uh, if you were paying my credit card. I, I think um, a lot of them still won't, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so I think payments... It's you want to make this as easy as possible for your customers, ensuring yeah. that they can purchase directly from you, whether they're booking or they're paying the same way that they would with an Uber and Lyft. You want to give them that ease of purchasing, that ease of trust. So I think payments is one of the, the clear um, insights that we've been able to see. Mm. Um, and I think communication is also a big one. So um when you're as an operator and you're driving and you're also managing customers, you need some automation in your communication. Mm -hmm. So if a customer, you know, is interested, maybe there's, um, 
and this, you know, this is something you can get with moves that there's a follow-up note that says, hey, we're working on your quote, we'll get back to you in 24 hours, yeah. right? Um, or, you know, managing all of your text communication in one application and not on your own personal line, for example, yeah. right? Those are all things that you're, you're able to do, you know, with moves. But I think communication and handling payments are two really, really big things. And then ultimately it's an element of service, right? For people to come back in, and purchase from you again, it's not like Uber and Lyft where it's one-off customers. Yeah. These are your customers at the end of the day. So just making sure that that element of service uh, that you're providing is essentially five stars, right? Will go a long way in building that repeat model. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one thing that we often hear complaints from, you know, loyal Uber and Lyft drivers, you know, I've done 25,000 rides, 4.99 right. star rating is that, you know, if I never see this passenger again, it's like, oh, you know, it's tough, right? Like, do I go out of my way to do, you know, go above and beyond or make a stop for them if yeah. I'm never going to see them again? I mean, it's kind of, you know, maybe it's the right thing to do or makes you feel good, but it's probably a bad business decision to be honest. Right. And so I think that this model also rewards people who kind of enjoy going out of their way or who enjoy providing extras or sort of, you know, those things where you're not necessarily often rewarded in the gig economy in a business like this. So I think that's, again, you know, I, I think we're starting to identify like this archetype, someone who hustles, but also someone who just kind of enjoys like building a relationship and sort of going out of their way, right? Because for me as a driver, you know, it would be really tough to go drive two hours to return someone's cell phone to not be paid. But if it's like my regular Monday customer, like I'd probably do that no problem, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that is uh, interesting. Is there any, what, what's the most challenging? Okay, well, we talked about demand, but like, is there a, you know, one part that's like really challenging or, you know, just difficult that like hasn't quite been figured out that you guys are working on or that you think drivers like often struggle with when they're building their own transportation business? When you're an owner operator, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll even categorize this as an owner driver, it's difficult to manage the business while also driving the business, mm -hmm. right? So it, um, back to my, my previous point, when, you're, when, when you have a customer that's interested in booking from you and you're not getting back to them right away, yeah. they're going to move on. Yeah. Right. Because maybe you're doing a ride for somebody else. Yep. So having the ability to make sure that the engine continues to run while you are, let's say, running the business, so to speak, and by running the business that's actually driving, for example, right. I think that that is is clearly one of the challenges, but it also represents the biggest opportunity as well. Right. Um, and so I think that that would be number one. Um, yeah. number well, I mean, that's is, a good point. I'm, I'm feeling bad now. Cause I, I remember times where I've gone on Yelp and, you know, submitted a quote and it's like, they didn't get back to me. I'm like, all right, next. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm you move on. You move on. Guilty it's, of it's, that, unfortunately. it's normal. And, um, and I think people's response time, um, and, and patience has waned yeah. over the years, especially because, uh, expectations are clearly, um, when you have, you know, the Amazons of the world that can commit to, you know, two hours or less for shipping expectations, obviously increase in terms of response times and things of that nature. But these are small businesses at the end of the day, right? They have to be able to manage their business, um, and run their business. So I think just making sure that you can do the things necessary to keep those customers who are interested to keep coming back. And I think the other one is availability. So, mm -hmm availability if you don't have availability for somebody that wants to purchase what do you do yeah right and the thing that's interesting in this private transportation industry is that they rely heavily on broker or affiliate relationships so moves actually gives you the ability to work with other operators in your mm. area and you can send them rides or they could send you rides that's so cool. And there's a, there is a trust element there. So you want to make sure that you're working with an operator that you trust. And we've kind of built that into the, to the software. That way, if you're working with Sally, who's a repeat customer, but you're doing a ride for Mary, Sally is taken care of because you're, yeah. you have a partnership with another operator who can fulfill that ride. And guess what? You're still getting paid for that yeah. ride as well. Yeah. And this is where I think it's so helpful to sort of look at comparative industries or examples, right? If you look to Uber, right, we've talked about some of the things they do poorly. One of the things that they do extremely well is balance supply and demand, right? I mean, uh, the pandemic has been a little rocky, but let's uh, cut that out for a second. Yeah, and you could yeah. say, you know, looking at Uber and Lyft, right? Like how, how many times have you ever seen 
no cars available, right? Or even before the pandemic, right in LA, like you would almost always get a car in three to seven minutes. You might have to pay for it. You might have to pay a lot of money for it, but that reliability was always there. And that's something that I think is so important to customers that every time they open the app or every time they call you for a ride, ideally you serve them, right? But they would rather have you pay, you know, 10x the price and someone serve you than no car at all, right? And so I think that principle of, you know, reliability and availability being so important is something that you really want to emulate in a business like this. It's like, hey, if this is your first time, if this is a first time customer and you have to send them to some driver who you've never worked with before, like, I'd rather do that than not at all. You know, if it's someone mm-hmm. who like mm-hmm. is your regular and, uh, you know, you have to send it to someone, you probably want to send it to someone, you know, that you know is going to be good, for example, right? Like, versus, you know, just kind of like sending them, feeding them off to the wolves. So that's why I think it is interesting to kind of study these comparative industries. And, you know, definitely, I think we've identified a couple cool uh, elements of sort of what it takes to be successful in running your own uh, transportation business. So uh, I think unless there's anything else, I want to give you the opportunity to ask me one question. And of course, you can also let us know uh, where to go to uh, find more about Swoop, uh, to sign up for moves and uh, kind of get going running your own transportation business. Yeah. And, um, you know, anybody that has questions after this, they can email me directly. Happy to, to um, cool. give them resources and all that good stuff. But the question I have for you is, you know, obviously you've seen the evolution of ride share and mobility and um, the, the gig economy over the last, you know, seven years, for example. What do the next seven years really look like? And what are maybe the, the top two or three trends that you're going to see over the next phase of, uh, of ride share gig economy and this evolution of mobility? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I guess what I would say is that over the past seven or eight years, a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't changed, right? Like the actual job that folks in the gig economy are doing is very similar. It's getting something from A to B, right? And sometimes A to B to C. <laughs> and so whether that's a person, whether that's a burrito, or now there's a whole bunch of different verticals, you know, marijuana, alcohol, mm-hmm. uh, construction materials, right? Like anything and everything. So that's like the part, I guess like the variety is what's changing, but the actual job is literally the same as it's always been and transportation has always been. And so I think that like identifying the things that, are going to stay the same is really interesting, you know, like actually like a completely open market is sometimes very challenging. If you look back to like taxis in the 1900s in New York city, right. It was like a free for all gypsy cabs everywhere. And it wasn't profitable. It wasn't until they put some caps and some, you know, reasonable constraints. Right. And they maybe took that a little too far, which is what allowed Uber and Lyft to grow. But that's what we're seeing, you know, now in a lot of cities, right. Like when Uber and Lyft could were a free for all actually back in New York again, you know, they ended up putting a cap on drivers and this time it was at a hundred thousand drivers. So, you know, probably more reasonable than 13,000 mm-hmm. taxi drivers. And so, I think like kind of going forward in the next seven or eight years, I think we'll keep seeing a lot of changes in the variety, right? Like new verticals being delivered, new categories being, um, explored more tools, you know, for the actual drivers, for the actual workers, but the job itself, I think is always going to be the same, right? When you're getting something from A to B, right? The challenging part is pickup. The challenging part is drop off driving down the middle of the street, you know, with a passenger, with a package, that's the easy part, right? Like communication is important, but it's usually at pickup and usually at drop off. Right. And so I think that part will be interesting. And then I think, you know, as far as like how workers and drivers fit into it, I do think there are a lot of opportunities uh, to sort of go out there and kind of take this 3.0 approach where, you know, 1.0 is kind of like pen and paper, you know, taking rides, doing rides. 2.0 was through the platforms. Okay. Uber now is sending me ton of lead gen. And now 3.0, I think these opportunities exist across all logistics businesses where if you actually want to become a true independent owner operator and have a Mm -hmm. great software like Move support you, I mean, we're seeing this in a lot of verticals. Dumpling is helping uh, folks that do grocery delivery build their own business in a very similar fashion. Cloud trucks just raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to help truck drivers do this. And so I think you're kind of seeing this uh, across a lot of these verticals. And I'll, I'll say, frankly, like, I think there's opportunity across 
across all of these verticals, you know, food delivery, you know, basically anything that gets delivered, right? There's going to be the platform approach, but then there's also, you know, for those who want to go down that route, you, you can kind of build your own actual business. And so I think that's kind of what is exciting. And for me, like, that's what, I don't know that this will happen for sure, but I do hope that more of these opportunities exist. And, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is to highlight this opportunity. I want more people going into this route because, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of people like coming into the gig economy. And, you know, obviously there's positives and negatives, but, you know, I think the positives outweigh the negatives. And, you know, like, if you don't like doing the job, don't do it. Right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple to me. Um, but if, you know, there are issues, like I'd rather not rely on the platforms to fix it and have like operators like Swoop, you know, build out this moves product. So, you know, if you're a driver that's done 25,000 trips on Uber and Lyft, and you don't feel that you're getting the loyalty you deserve, go start your own business. Right. And that's sort of the solutions that, you know, I don't, I can't predict that those are going to happen, but that is what I'm hoping uh, things trend in that direction. So I am definitely appreciative of what you guys are doing at Swoop and the Moose product. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have you back on in uh, less than two years time and there won't exactly. be uh, too many up and downs in between. So we'll definitely link uh, to Swoop website and if folks want to follow you guys or what's the best place, where, where should they go? Website, social media. What yeah, you guys? Yeah, I know you guys are active on Instagram too. We are you know? active on Instagram. You can follow us at, at swoop. Um, cool. You can also check out our website at uh, movesapp.com or swoopapp.com. Perfect. Sounds good, Pete. Well, appreciate uh, all the time and all the information and uh, look forward to seeing more in the future. Take care. Thanks, Harry. Appreciate it.